you, but. Wow. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much for that warm welcome. It's fantastic to be here uh, tonight uh, for this very special dialogue that we're hosting on the opening night of the Apologetics Canada event. I'm Justin Briley, and uh, as Andy said, I am part of a show that we call Unbelievable with a question mark that is hosted in the UK but is listened to around the world via podcast. And uh, I, I just wondered, I, this is a terrible thing to ask, but <laughs> has anyone listened to The Unbelievable Show before? We've got a few hands. Hey! Great. That's, that's great. Well, all of you guys are actually part of The Unbelievable Show tonight, which is good, because we're recording tonight's event, and we're going to broadcast it on our radio station in the UK and indeed podcast it around the world. So um, why don't we give a very big Canadian welcome to the international radio and podcast audience. Hey! Yes. Wow. Thank you. Um, so welcome along to tonight's dialogue. Uh, it's on the Foundation for Human Rights, a Christian and Humanist in Dialogue. And it's a great pleasure to be joined on the stage tonight by Andy Bannister and Justin Trottier. Andy is director of the Solas Center for Public Christianity in the UK and was also a one-time director of Arzim here in Canada. Andy is also the author of The Atheist Who Didn't Exist or The Terrible Consequences of Bad Arguments. Very highly recommended book, very funny book actually. I think it's also available at the book stand here. Uh, Justin Trottier is the CEO of the Canadian Association for Equality and has previously founded secular organizations such as the Free Thought Association of Canada, which was behind Canada's very own atheist bus campaign several years ago. So uh, Andy tonight is our Christian and Justin is our humanist. Can you give them both a very warm welcome? And I also want to welcome uh, everyone who is watching via the live streaming venue. So welcome along. Thank you for joining us for tonight's event. I want everyone to feel part of this because we're actually going to be coming to you for your questions later on in the evening. So after we've had our dialogue here on the stage, we're going to be going having a short break. And then it's your opportunity to ask the questions of my guests tonight. Uh, there's a few ways you can do that. Um, there's going to be an opportunity to do that via SMS text. So uh, we've got some details, I think, coming up on the screen about this. But you can text ACCONF18 <laughs> to 37607. There we go, to join the session. That's the way to do it via text. Or you can submit a question at the website, pollev.com slash ACCONF18 or simply tweet your question if you're on Twitter to at ApologeticsCA. You can do that at any point in the evening. We're going to try and um, accumulate a number of those and, and feed those into the Q&A a little bit later on. There will also be microphones here in the auditorium uh, set up on the side aisle so that if you want to come forward and ask a question yourself, then you can do that as well as part of the Q&A. And we'll go through the etiquette for that a little bit later on. Uh, please do uh, tonight, I'm sure you will do this anyway, but please do respect our speakers. Uh, no cheering or jeering during <laughs> the conversation, except for Andy, that's fine. No, um, and please Thank you. Um, hold any applause <laughs> until the end of the, uh, the conversation when we can show our appreciation for everyone that's been involved. But for now, do again give a very warm welcome to Justin Trottier and Andy Bannister. <laughs> Right. Well, um, it's really fun to be here and do is, this actually it? on stage. So thank you both gentlemen for, yeah. for agreeing to, to come on and do this uh, live dialogue. Um, why don't we meet you both, first of all? So, uh, Hello, Justin, Justin. This, this might be confusing. We're both Justins, but we'll try <laughs> and... <laughs> I, I was going to say, how did they end up with two Justins and two Andys at the same conference? But um, Intelligent design. Uh, well, <laughs> who knows? <laughs> hey. <laughs> <laughs> the battle of the bad jokes. I, yeah, we, absolutely. Um, it's your move now. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't ask Andy to start joking about it. It's things. all right. It's, um, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, keep calm and carry on. <laughs> oh dear. Um, right. So um, tonight we're asking, um, what are the foundations for human rights? Um, it seems kind of fitting, actually, that we're doing this. I think it's the 70th year this year, the anniversary of the, Decora the Universal um, yes. Declaration of Human Rights. And uh, that's... that's a significant anniversary in many ways, because I think it causes us to ask, 
Why do we believe in the concept of universal human rights to begin with? And, um, and ultimately, the, I think the question we're going to be getting to tonight is, are such beliefs in the inherent dignity and quality of all human beings best grounded in uh, Christianity or humanism? Uh, but before we get to all that, why don't we talk to you both about your background? So, mm. Justin, um, you're a humanist. Um, tell us, what is, what is a humanist to you, and what does that mean for your life? I just first just thank everybody for being here tonight really quick and also in particular to thank um, Apologetics and Steve uh, who I worked with in terms of uh, coordinating mm. my participation tonight and I just they did an amazing job they're extremely professional and well organized and um, I just really want to thank them for all Absolutely. that they did to, yeah. to get to all of us here today um, also good to see Andy again. We've been at this a few times. We have. Here we go again. Um, <laughs> that wasn't to be funny, but it's really good to see Andy and to meet Justin as well. And you well. still haven't convinced him yet. I mean, it's... Yeah. Likewise. Maybe, maybe yeah. next time. Who knows? Um, so I do call myself a humanist, but I should also say I call myself a number of other things. So I'm an atheist. I'm a free thinker. I'm a humanist. Um, I'm also a secularist. Those sort of mean slightly different things. They're not inconsistent. They sort of touch on different elements of my identity. Uh, you asked about humanism. Um, that is how I would describe my ethical understanding. Uh, atheism is simply my lack of belief in God um, or my belief that there isn't sufficient evidence to compel me to believe in God. Um, and I'm a secularist politically. And I don't think that secularism is necessarily inconsistent if it's political secularism <coughs> with either atheism or theism. I think you can agree that we want institutional neutrality, which is how I describe my secularism, um, regardless of what our beliefs are with respect to religion. So I'm sorry for that long way. No, answer. That, that's, that's yeah. helpful. I mean, turning to the, the atheist label in that sense, um, do, does that for you imply anything about the way you understand the universe? I mean, presumably you don't believe there is any supernatural dimension to the universe. Does it, would, would you subscribe to something like naturalism, the view that all that does exist is natural stuff, you know, matter in motion, the natural forces of the universe and so on? Yeah, I think naturalism may be a better way to encapsulate my worldview. Um, I, it's that I don't see that the burden of proof has been met by any religious uh, community. So it's not that I'm anti-Christian or anti-Jewish or anti-religion even. It's just that without there being evidence, and to my mind there isn't compelling evidence for something as really complicated and as serious as a god, that's a serious claim, um, I think one should kind of uh, withdraw or not consent to a claim unless there's sufficient evidence to compel one to, uh, to believe it. And do you feel that in that sense, you, the worldview of naturalism is the more compelling one for you in terms of the, the ones that are on offer out there? Well, naturalism is simply the claim that the world exists um, and that reality is what, what it presents itself to us, um, what, what science can show us to be true through really just the, the tools that science has, which are an extension of our five senses. So I'm not sure that reality, other than if you're a solipsist, that you really need to convince anybody else. We can all kind of agree on that at least. It's when we talk about metaphysics where there is room for disagreement, sure. and uh, that's where I might part, part ways with some of the other people in this room. <laughs> and, 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 when it, and when it comes to your humanism specifically, uh, that, that is, as you say, more about the ethical concerns you have. Yes. And, and so wh why call it humanism specifically? Is it to do with the the kind of ethics we come up with as humans, essentially. So honestly, I, I would not choose that term. I'm just going to be really, really blunt about it. I'm not here really to defend um, really anybody else's worldview. I'm just going to talk about what my worldview is. So I am a humanist because I think that is, the, that is kind of the closest we've gotten to the kind of ethical worldview that I espouse. But I think that label really perhaps needs to, needs to evolve somewhat um, because it is human-centered. And I would actually suggest that there are, there are animal creatures out there, non-human animals, that um, are probably deserving of some basic rights, human rights, so that's why that, uh, that human, human mm. uh, uh, center term is, is limiting. Um, so I would probably go a little, bit, a little bit beyond that. But basically, humanism is about the marriage of rationality and compassion. Those are sort of the pillars that I would, that I would try to bring together okay. to describe what humanism is all about. Fantastic. Thank you very much for joining us tonight, <coughs> Justin, for this dialogue. Andy, uh, welcome along as well. Um, tell Great us a little bit here. about yourself. You're obviously a Christian. Uh, is that something that you've 
always been or adopted at some point and yeah. what, what difference does that make to the way you live your life? That's a, that's a, that's a great question, uh, Justin. It's, it's so confusing with two... I know, I'm have sorry. J we'll have to have JB and J JT and J I'll talk about JC a bit. J but, uh, you know, Justin Bieber, <laughs> Justin <laughs> Justin Trudeau, Bieber and Justin... And, no. Let's not go there. But uh, <laughs> just to actually echo Justin's comments, I mean, really grateful to all of you folks for coming out and joining us on a slightly damp uh, Vancouver evening. And uh, just a heads up, actually, if the three of us this evening are looking slightly tired, it's because uh, this Justin and I were eight hours off your time zone, and poor old Justin T on the end here uh, had a sort of 10 hour flight delay in Edmonton and got in about midnight last night. So all of us are sort of suffering slightly. So if we nod off during the dialogue, it's not that you guys are boring us. Um, but to your question, Justin, yeah, so I'm, I'm a Christian, and uh, yeah, my story is an interesting one. So I was raised in a kind of Christian home. And uh, like I think many kind of Christian young people, uh, certainly in my kind of sort of mid to late teens, really sort of found myself questioning like, kind of what that, what that really meant. And then particularly, I think what was interesting for me was uh, in, the, in the sort of mid to late 1990s when I began really actually encountering and dialoguing with people who believed differently to me, particularly Muslims in my case, some atheists but also Muslims, really challenged me to ask some pretty profound questions about whether what I believed was true. And I think that's really ultimately what, what matters. And I think this is something that Justin and I will agree on this evening. What matters is what's true. And I found myself profoundly challenged to sort of face up to the question of are the things that I've been raised in true? Or are they just sort of, you know, sort of pious stories? Um, is Islam true? In which case, I guess I need to believe that. Or are none of these things true? In which case, I need to follow the evidence where it leads. And actually, that began my journey into academia and uh, led me to be ever more convinced, actually, that Christianity is true. I think when I was in my teens, I probably believe because my parents did. I couldn't give you any reasons. Now I can give you, mm. you know, hundreds of hours of reasons why I think Christianity is true. And I think if it's true, it changes everything. And I think this is one of the interesting things that we may touch on this evening. That's actually interesting. If you read around human rights theory and philosophers who have written on it from both sides, actually you can find many atheists and many Christians agreeing that actually everything changes if there is a, if there is a God. Um, you know, Friedrich Nietzsche, you know, famously kind of saw that and others. So I think, yeah, on this question of human dignity, human value, human worth, yeah, I believe as a, as a, as a Christian that everything hangs mm. on, uh, on whether, you know, material things are not just the only reality, as, as Justin put it. Well, um, it's great to, to have those introductions to you both. Um, in a sense, it could be argued that the concept of universal human rights is a relatively recent concept, yeah. historically speaking. As I say, 70 years this year since the, uh, the, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. I'm just going to read just a section of the first article here, which yeah. was drafted 70 years ago. All human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. They are endowed with reason and conscience and should act towards one another in a spirit of brotherhood. Just before we get into sort of looking at the grounding and the foundations for all this, um, what, what for you is so important, in a sense, about having this kind of a universal declaration of human rights, Justin? Well, I think you just read it. It's kind of there in the preamble, endowed with reason and conscience. And some people in the room might think endowed by God. Um, I would argue endowed by the process of natural selection, um, endowed by, uh, by evolution. That is, it, it's something that happened naturally, but whatever the origin is, the fact that we do have these special capacities to reason, to self-determination, to uh, free will, and to acts of, of creativity, to, in other words, to be moral agents, we have all of the prerequisites to be moral agents, means that we're both deserving of uh, human rights protections, but it also comes along with responsibilities, responsibilities that other kind of free agents wouldn't, uh, wouldn't have to bear. And the, Internet, the uh, Human Rights Declaration, I think, was the culmination of actually thousands of years of history. So I, I would maybe dispute a little bit on whether it is new. It's certainly mm -hmm. the first time we've come together as a, as a planet and issued a declaration like that. But I think it is really the culmination or the climax of of a number of trends, and not just Western trends. I mean, you could look at, uh, well, the Code of Hammurabi is often invoked as maybe one of the first sort of quasi-human rights-style declarations mm -hmm. back in the, I think it was the 17th century BC. Um, you've got the Magna Carta much more recently in, in, in Britain. So there are, there are a number of um, sort of... Staging posts Staging posts, yeah, yeah, that's a good way yeah. to put it. Yeah. Uh, what, what, what for you is the significance of this uh, a declaration of universal human rights, Andy? Yeah, I mean, a, a really good question. I think what fascinates, uh, 
what fascinates me is, I mean, you obviously quoted from the preamble, but if you mm. go a little bit even further back, I mean, the whole of the uh, UDHR is really founded on this idea of human dignity and, uh, and human value. That's the kind of language that's, that's used there. And so I think, I find this fascinating for two reasons. One is, of course, the question it raises, and that's the one we're going to get into this evening. But I think also that, that foundation that flows out of that, because I think really that is the question. You know, do, do you, do I, do each member of the audience here, do we actually have the inherent dignity, the inherent value that the UDHR talks about? If so, then exactly as Justin has said, so many things flow from there. And I'm glad that, you know, Justin, you mentioned responsibility as well, because often we just talk about human rights. I think we need to talk about responsibilities. Um, so many things flow out of that. But of course, if we don't have that dignity, if we don't have that value, then all bets are off. So I think the UDHR does a wonderful job of, I think, focusing the spotlight on the key mm. question. Mm. But what's interesting, and this is, I think, we're going to explore this evening, the UDHR doesn't give any reasons. I think that's been the critique of it. It uses words like, we have dignity, we have value, we have these innate things. And you read it, certainly, if you're an inquiring person, you go, wonderful, what can you, we, we need some evidence. As, as you said at the start, evidence is hugely important. And it sort of doesn't give it. Right, which is it just why it assumes it at assumes some it, level. Which is why it opens up space for dialogues by yeah. this evening. Well, but in a way, I think that's, that's kind of uh, um, potentially a, a good thing um, rather than a flaw. Because it does mean that however you've come to believe in the validity of human dignity or human rights as a way of defending that dignity, uh, you can find the, the declaration to make sense to you and different traditions will come up with different foundations. And, and even if you're a theist or you're an atheist, there are still going to be rival you know, uh, ideas about how do you lay the foundations for human rights. So it's not like the only debates between atheists and theists, mm. far from it. There is really interesting conversations happening in both yeah. of those camps. But by not really limiting itself, the declaration that is, to one particular foundation, it allows all of these multifaceted ways that we've arrived, some from the West, some from the East, for example, um, to all kind but, of find a home in that declaration. Do, do you believe that fundamentally undergirding all that is actually this evolutionary process which gives us this awareness of our shared reason, shared humanity, and so on, which seems to be what you said is, is what endows us with that, that conscience, that right. reason, and so on? Right, but I'm not hinging on that. Right. I mean, what I am hinging on are the capacities that we have, mm. you know, and I'd, I named a few before, you know, mm. there's also capacities to feel pleasure and pain, uh, capacities to, as I said earlier, sort of make responsible actions and then held, held, be held responsible for the actions that we make. Those are the sorts of qualities that are, uh, if not uniquely human, certainly we have them in, uh, in higher degrees than any other species. And so that's the shared common humanity that I think is the foundation for the universality of the human rights. Yeah, I think I, that's an interesting observation. I think what's fascinating, though, is I think the, the fact that the, the framers of the UDHR, I think, quite deliberately steered away from that. That they, they, the foundation there that's chosen from is not so much those capacities. If you read the document, it flows out of the sense of the claim that we have this dignity, we have this value. And I think the interesting question is to actually ask whether you can ground that in every worldview. It's interesting, Justin, that you said, you know, there are you know, different atheist perspectives, different Christian perspectives on this. Um, let me just read you a very, very brief line from Richard Rorty, a very well-regarded ethicist, uh, postmodern liberal theorist, atheist. Um, he wrote a, a little essay a few years ago called Postmodern Bourgeois Liberalism. And in that, these are his words as an atheist. He says, secular liberals like myself are effectively freeloading atheists. He says, we continue to rely on the Judeo-Christian legacy of human dignity, despite the fact we reject the revealed truth that could support that concern. And I think one of the questions I find interesting is whether actually, if you have metaphysical naturalism, that we are just this process of time plus chance, plus natural selection. You can certainly talk about these wonderful faculties that we have, but whether you can actually say that you, that I, that Justin, that members of the audience have innate dignity, that becomes problematic, because innate dignity means actually you have dignity irrespective of your abilities. Mm -hmm. And of course this flows into, you know, sort of disabilities and rights and other kind of issues of going, somebody who's a human being who has none of those capacities due to, say, profound disability, the UDHR would say, no, no, just because you are human, and for no other reason, you have dignity and value from which these things flow. I think that's the brilliance of the document, but that's also the question that it raises. Well, I'm not going to sort of take up the mantle of, an, of any other atheists or 
Fair enough. Right? Or anybody else for that matter. I'm not going to ask you to do the same thing. I'm not going to sort of quote Christians and ask you to defend their particular point of view. They've Lots of Christians say lots of different things. I think we can agree on that. Um, but the issue, the, sort of theoretically, is Christianity as a as a as a framework. Is it uh, the right foundation? Is it a foundation? And if it is, I guess I would kind of ask a bit tongue in cheek, although not really. Why did it take two thousand years? Yeah. I mean, why is it that you have this event? Um, if you believe it's a historical event about uh, Jesus' death on the cross, if that is what sort of brought meaning and 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 um, human dignity into the world. Um, as I think I've heard you argue, yep. then why did it take 2,000 years? Why did it happen in, um, in particular circumstances, notably the early modern period, the end of serfdom, um, the coming to fruition of scientific enlightenment values? Why was that the context where Christianity finally sort of brought us, brought us yep. human rights? So why do, you need, um, why do you need to sort of wait for that to, uh, to bear fruit? Yeah. That's a brilliant question. So let me say, I'll say, I'll say a couple of things, actually. What's interesting, actually, is a piece of work just been done. Um, and for folks who like Googling, I'll let you go Google this, that in comparative sociology, uh, issue 17, which is the latest issue this year, has just done um, a paper, and they're looking at the whole question of, are, you know, could, do the, could the various certainly religious systems of the world be considered to be equally good foundations for mm. human rights? And the conclusion is actually interesting, that, the, that, that that's not the case. Uh, that it does seem to be the Judeo-Christian legacy has offered something. If we look at, uh, if we look around the world today, there are, you know, for example, when it comes to things like religious freedom, um, it goes without, uh, it goes really without controversy that uh, it's largely Muslim-majority countries that come top of the list for religious free freedom restrictions for a whole number of reasons. We could push into, into that. It would be an interesting conversation. But in terms of the historical piece, though, I want to say a couple of things here. I think. Certainly, I think you can certainly accuse the church at times of being slow of catching on. Certainly catching on to that idea, I think, built into the biblical revelation that uh, Christians are made in the image of God. That's where the idea comes from in Christianity, that we have innate value. Genesis chapter 1 verse... Or all people, in fact. Or all people, actually. Yeah, yeah I'm not yeah. saying just Christians. That human, by, by people, mm. I mean human beings. Um, Christians actually got hold of that far more quickly than is actually given credit for. So, for example, it's interesting... If you look at pagan critics of Christianity in the first two or three hundred years, what were Christians criticized for? Christians were criticized for the fact that they were including within Christian churches, alongside cultured Romans and Greeks, they were including uh, slaves, women, children, all those classes of society that, interestingly, Aristotle, of course, believed were subhuman. Mm -hmm. And you have someone like Aristotle, absolutely brilliant philosopher, but mounted an amazingly persuasive argument, for, at least for his, for his peers, that actually it's only men who in, enjoy the things that we've talked about. But, but the church cut right across that, and so around about 180, you find a you know, critic like Celsus, pagan Roman, criticizing Christians for that. We come through the 6th century, you know, we find the first kind of anti-slavery arguments really coming to the fore. People like Patrick, uh, St. Patrick and Ireland, you know, very early, often that actually overlooked, actually. Everyone goes for people like Wilberforce, but he was you know, mounting a spectacularly quite successful anti-slavery uh, anti campaign as early as the mm -hmm. 600s. Has the church not been as quick on catching on some of this? I would actually take that critique on the chin and say, I think at times Christians should have woken up to what's in their own tradition. But I think the question... But what, we're, all sorry, I'll, say I'll, wait, just, I'll wait until you're done. Yeah, all I'd say, and I'll pass the baton back to you. I think to me the, the question isn't so much what Christians how or have or haven't done. The question that intrigues me is reality. I just want to keep focusing us on the question of, do you actually have, do I have, does Justin have, do our audience members have this evening, is this innate dignity that the UDHR talks about, is it real? Is it actually a reality, or is it just a sort of quasi-legal contract? I, mean, I do want to come back first, though, on something that you said, because yes, you were applauding the early, the early Christian community with respect to sort of, as an example, including women in their, in their meetings. And um, I, I guess I'm not, I'm not going to tarnish every single thing that Christian communities have done. That's not my business. We were just talking about sort of the theoretical foundation. So, I did give some examples where the church was um, kind of behind the times. I might also throw out the fact that the Pope, you know, was the one to oppose the Magna Carta. He believed it interfered with King John's divine right of kings, this great chain of being, which in the medieval world the church was pushing forward, rather regressive, when you think about it from a modern point of view. So we can kind of trade that back and forth. But if we're just going to kind of talk about the early Christian community, we're going to talk about, let's say, women, for example, Paul in Ephesians, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, uh, 522 says, Wives, submit yourself to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of, of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. Um, we also know in Genesis that uh, 
uh, Eve was made from man. Man was made by God in the image of God. You write about that, of course, but was woman made in the image of God? Or was yeah, can I, woman made yeah. from man and then so man a named of, a couple woman? Of ones, a biblical well, issues. Well, being. the great thing is... Well, I did my homework. So <laughs> that, that's that great, Justin. Up, so. that's, uh, <laughs> that's, uh, that's fantastic. Lucky I, uh, lucky I read a few bits of atheism as well. <laughs> we, we, we should be... Uh, I believe you wrote a book on it, actually. <laughs> I that. Yes, we should. And uh, there were some pretty bad arguments out there. That was a moderately bad <laughs> argument, because <laughs> right. Genesis 1, 26 then. and 27. Well, the great thing is, to, in reverse order, the image of God uh, text uh, in Genesis 1, 26, 27, which is central to, you know, sort of thinking about anthropology for both Jews and Christians, actually says, yes, in the image of God, he made them male and female, he created them. So actually, right there in the beginning. Ephesians is interesting, because if you read more widely in that passage, you'll also find it talks about mutual Submission. Mm -hmm. It also goes on as well, which is often missed, to say to, to husbands um, that we are to love our wives as Christ loved the church. So I'm actually called to lay my life down for my wife. So if you read that passage carefully, it's actually quite a balanced argument about the responsibilities on, on both sides. And what's interesting about, about biblical texts, one of the challenges is we tend to forget we're reading them through 2,000 years or more, and we tend to read them through, through a Western lens. Sure. We tend to read back into that, because I know you're, you're married as, as, as well, and so we tend to read back into that through the kind of relationships we have with our wives, and we take it for granted we love our wives. Mm -hmm. In the ancient world, it wasn't taken for granted as a Roman or Greek husband, you, you, you loved your wife. In fact, usually the pattern was your wife was there for the raising of children, and you had a whole collection of you know, mistresses and concubines on the side for the, for, for the other kind of stuff. And the New Testament cuts right across that. And that, if you read the commentaries, um, scholars will tell you that was a pretty radical yeah. statement, again, for a, for a Greek or, a Jew, or even a Jewish husband to be hearing. Yeah, and again, I'm not trying to knock everything, but, but I just want to say quickly, you're, if, if we're going to avoid looking at 2,000 years ago through modern eyes, I think we might also, at this, the same time, realize sometimes we're perhaps interpreting things more positively in light of our modern sensibilities than maybe was actually there in, in I think, the book originally. Yeah. I think, I think you're absolutely right. And I think there's a couple of things going on here that's quite interesting because I think we, we all have a tendency to do this with our own traditions. I think one of the things that both atheists and Christians can do, we can have a tendency to try and read our own tradition more positively and to read the other tradition more negatively. So it's actually very interesting. The other, the other night we did an event like this down in Vancouver and during the Q&A, somebody raised the issue of Hitler. Mm -hmm. And uh, which was funny because actually my, my humanist co-partner earlier in the evening had said, let's just agree that nobody mentioned Hitler this evening. <laughs> and uh, I wish we had made that agreement earlier. <laughs> <laughs> but what was great was Ian and I had this, actually ended up agreeing with each other and saying that I think, for example, that's a classic example because Christians have a tendency to pick up the Third Reich and use it to whack atheists around the head with, and some atheists have a tendency to pick up Hitler and try and whack Christians yeah, yeah. around the head with him. And I think we can all have a tendency to try and read history in a way that benefits us and overlooks the mistakes of our community. What I would say is one of the things that's so, I think, incredibly exciting about really good biblical scholarship is we actually in some ways know far more about the ancient cultures today than we did uh, you know, even 50 years or 100 years ago, particularly without going down particularly this rabbit trail, but for, for example for the Gospels, we now have the Dead Sea Scrolls, and we know so much more about first century Judaism than perhaps any time in biblical scholarship. If, if I could move the conversation on, yes, because we've, we've a really interesting <laughs> conversation sort of addressing the, this question of whether the Bible does sort of actually meet modern standards of what we would call universal human rights. I, s I think the, the, the reverse question to you, Justin, is the question of, of whether a naturalistic viewpoint, um, a, you know, specifically a sort of secular humanistic viewpoint, can ground mm. these, these, these modern ideas of universal human rights. I mean, you've already said that you think you can get this from a sort of uh, scientific grounding. Um, so are, these, are, are these, these beliefs in the intrinsic dignity and equality of all humans are they something that are, are discovered, that already exist in some sense out there, or are they things we, we essentially invent, we impose upon reality, there, and therefore in that sense they're to some extent subjective rather than, than yeah. objective? So let me just first kind of clarify one thing. To say that I think that they're scientific isn't to say that they're going to be found um, in, the, in a laboratory, sure. but it is to say that whatever they are, they have to be consistent with well, what we do find in the laboratory. I mean, it wouldn't make much sense to impose on us requirements that are physically impossible, for example. So we, whatever kind of moral system we create, we as human beings have to be capable of actually, you know, executing it or implementing it. Um, 
so just to put that that aside to your to your particular question, I don't think they're really either invented or discovered. I'm not sure I would I would describe them with either of those terms. They're not discovered because they don't they don't really exist out there, like in a Platonic reality, like uh, like mathematical truths in that kind of sense. As I said, they're not going to be found in a, in the laboratory. Um, if if a universe exists somewhere without uh, rational or sentient creatures, uh, then human rights wouldn't really be a meaningful concept. On the other hand, they're not invented um, in the sense of kind of an arbitrary or contingent kind of creation. I think instead they just sort of flow from human capacities. And that was, uh, I think that was the first comment that I made, that it is because we have those capacities, capacities that, you know, uh, this, whatever this thing is here. Uh, really <laughs> it's a very cool wooden log table yes. is what it is. <laughs> Whatever it is, it doesn't have those capacities. And you wouldn't expect God to just declare that this thing had human rights. It, you, you, sure, you know what I'm saying? there's so something about that, it. That, there's something that about it. it. It's right. intrinsically got those capacities. It's, it's something how, how random. Do you, how do you determine right. what, what does and doesn't have those rights then? Why, why do we ascribe them to humans and not to woodlouse or, or something else? Well, I should say, I think perhaps we should be expanding them somewhat mm. to some of the... Uh, members of the animal kingdom. Right. I would, for example, consider, I'm not saying that, uh, let's say chimpanzees, for example, may probably be the, the first species we would seriously look at. And in fact, there is a project right now that is seeking to um, bring a court case, uh, I forget the jurisdiction, I think in New York uh, State, where there are some chimpanzees that are being used for research. And the argument is being made that uh, these chimpanzees are capable of some of the same things that we are that they can feel pleasure and pain, um, that, they can ha that they know themselves, if they, um, they can have uh, actions that they commit themselves to, that they interact with other people in a way where you can play games with them and they will actually show some understanding of fairness in certain of these games. Um, so some of these capacities may be the kinds of things where we want to explore, not giving them all the rights that we have, that would be absurd, but certain protections at least that they don't enjoy right now, such as imprisoning these conscious right. creatures. So Andy, mm. Justin saying that, okay, not exactly discovered or invented, but rather flowing from the capacities we have to experience pain and pleasure, to reason, uh, to know ourselves, to be self-conscious in that sense. Um, why for you isn't that an adequate grounding for yeah. universal human rights? Well, th well, I, think, I think two things um, I would say there. I think what's interesting is if one takes that route, I think it's worth it to start recognizing what we're doing. We are at that point tearing up most of the early foundational work on, on human rights, the UNHDR and other documents, which quite consciously chose the, the kind of dignity, the innate value, uh, you know, inalienable kind of sort of properties that flow out of being human. And again, sometimes, you know, for those of us who are perhaps non-philosophers, what do we mean when we say, you know, innate dignity? Well, again, it means that you have a dignity and a value that comes just because you're a human, just because you're a human, just because you're a human, not because of anything you can do. And I think the, the danger, once you then sort of, uh, sort of throw that out and say, well, instead we're gonna look for capacity, is you do hit this rather awkward question of what happens with human beings who don't have that capacity. And that's why um, the work that I think Andy Steiger and others are doing on the Human Project is quite interesting, because this whole dehumanization angle Dehumanization is a real threat right now. And if you look through history, it's always been the way that we've kind of sort of tried to sort of carve off and dispose of people we don't want around. You can't actually get rid of another human being. That's, that's been demonstrated in history, actually. Um, you know, humans don't tend to kill other humans. Humans tend to kill other people that they've labeled as something other than human. And so if we think that's not going on today, well, it still is. There are parts of the world where that kind of labeling is still going on. Uh, if you look at what's happening around Down syndrome right now, for example. So I think. Once we, once we start trying to locate it in capacity and ability and those kind of things, that raises the awkward question of what do you have if you don't have those capacities? Is the, just is the first just expand a bit on the comment you made about those with Down syndrome. Yeah, so right now, for example, there's a move in, in many kind of countries, some of the Scandinavian countries are sort of taking the forefront of this and saying how could we, how can we sort of construct a world uh, through you know, various kind of biological means, through selective abortion, eugenics, other kind of bits and pieces, whereby you know, we no longer have uh, Down syndrome in our society. But as disability rights advocates have sort of talked about, they've gone, well, that's dehumanizing language. Because when we talk about uh, we no longer want Down syndrome, what you actually mean is people who have Down syndrome. And Down's is interesting, because we have, uh, you know, back in the UK, we have uh, two 
two families that were very close friends with who have Down syndrome children who would be adamant that's a type of, that's a type of, that's a type of person, that's actually, a, that's actually a community that we're talking about here. But it's just that dehumanizing language that we like to push people that we want to sort of, sort of, uh, you know, sort of treat in a way that perhaps we wouldn't treat others. The, it's the, the, the language begins, first of all, to try to recategorize them in a way that they don't belong like the rest of us. And I think interesting, they just end on this and then happily pass across. I mean, I think again, um, to quote someone from the atheist side, I mean, Sam Harris, very well-regarded atheist, it's quite interesting here, and he wrote on this whole issue of capacity, and he said the problem with going down the capacity route is if you, if you draw that capa those capacities too tightly, then you do start excluding vast numbers of the, of, of the human community, the very, very young, the very, very old, those who are profoundly disabled, and if you draw them too loosely, then you do start drawing in all other kind of things. I mean, it's not so much the issue, perhaps the great apes, but you start drawing in uh, you know, all kinds of life, you know, rats and aardvarks and lettuces and so on and so forth. So Sam, I, mean, if I, I respect his honesty in going, it's a real problem where you draw the, the boundaries. To, but if Sam were here, I'd say, I mean, do, do you want to it, respond? it is a real problem, but that's why my, my reaction to that problem is to go the other route, not to dehumanize. Those are horrifying stories that you're talking about, dehumanizing people with Down syndrome, but to humanize more non-humans, perhaps. And not just chimpanzees or other animals. What about if we encounter alien intelligence? It might sound kind of speculative, but those are not humans, but they're persons in a philosophical sense. Should we not be expanding protection and, of course, the same kind of rights to them? What about where we're going with artificial intelligence? We were talking yeah. you know, backstage about this potential possibility. Um, if ever we could realize um, such far-fetched things like downloaded consciousnesses, would we not want to expand protection and rights there too? So I would rather actually go the other route and humanize more things than fall mm. into this trap of potentially going yeah. the other way and dehumanizing. What I, what I find really fascinating about that, Justin, is the moment you start using the term humanizing, it's almost actually that you are inherently recognizing what the founders of the UDH are recognized. There is something special about, about humankind. There is something and a word that's interesting, actually, as I was doing a lot of reading preparing for, for tonight and the dialogue on Wednesday, um, and reading sort of quite widely in some of the literature, and as you say, there are, there are atheists, secular humanists, as well as Christians who've written widely on this. The word that almost everybody uses is the word sacred. I came across a lot of the atheist writers who talk about human life being, being sacred. And, um, and I think that's interesting that you're, it's almost a tacit admission there that we would, we would extend the circle of humanity to include others. And again, that brings us back to the question I think we're dancing around. Is there something actually inherently valuable about, about human beings? Is there, were the founders of the UDHR correct? And if so, but what's going from on From a there? Christian point of, oh, I was going to ask, do, do, I mean, do, do, are you happy to use that language of there being something intrinsically valuable about sure, humans? Of course. Well, about, about those creatures who have the natural capacities that I described. And I do want to come back, because you did, you know, kind of, put me in the spotlight about capacities, yes. and, I, and it's, a, it's, a fair, it's a fair question to ask. I guess my response would be, we're talking about those things which have um, sort of the, these natural capacities, not that they're always being realized. I mean, when we go to sleep, for example, we're not exercising rational thought, but nobody would think that suddenly we don't deserve human rights because we're temporarily unconsciously asleep. That would be ridiculous. If we're in a, in a coma, for example, we're still beings that have the abilities to, uh, mm. to have all those capacities. For my example. wife would say that the volume I snore at, I have definitely given up some rights when I sleep, but that's another <laughs> discussion. Well, um, well, I mean, I'd be interested to know though, so for instance, in the, in the issue with, say, a child with Down syndrome, they, they may not have the same types of capacities as a child of equivalent age who doesn't have that. But d I think Andy's concern is if we start saying, rights are contingent upon having certain capacities, yeah. perhaps some ability to reason or process things, then if we start linking it to that, we then do run this risk of dehumanizing people that we instinctively feel should have the same rights as, as everyone else. Right, so first of all, what I described was a series of different capacities, mm. uh, not any one or two. Um, and so those capacities, uh, I think, do encompass pretty much every human being, and then some. Um, and I would also obviously exercise the cautionary principle here. So if human beings as a species are largely capable of these capacities, although not every member at all times are doing so, then I would say every human being is kind of in that, in that grouping. But again, I'm, you know, it's a challenging question and I'm doing my best to answer mm -hmm. it, but on the other hand, what about the challenge I'm putting forward about, incur about more 
uh, non-human animals being okay. included, about AI being included, about aliens being included. I mean, how does, it, how does a, a Christian even approach that? Is it even possible? If you believe yeah. that Jesus' death on the cross gives these rights in, uh, to every human being, which, which admittedly is, is, um, is an evolution over what came before, where rights were, if there were rights, they were limited to p p people of particular group, culture, nation, what have you. So this was really mm -hmm. universalizing things, and I, that was a great thing. But it kind of has to stop with humans, doesn't it? How do you extend it? Are you, is that a concern that you would have? Well, that's a, that's a, fa that's a fascinating question. I mean, I I'm, I'm really appreciate your, your willingness to recognize it was a, a dramatic shift. And, uh, you know, one of my... One of, my, one of my favorite sort of, uh, you know, atheist thinkers on this, there's a, there's a French atheist writer called Luc Ferry who wrote a wonderful book called A Brief History of Thought, uh, which surveys the whole of kind of Western philosophy. And he's quite anti-Christian in places, but around human rights, he's very positive for the, just that right reason. Yeah. He says that we forget historically that really until, until Christianity came along, exactly, you know, Allah, Aristotle and others, there really was a sense of some people have rights and the rest don't. Mm -hmm. He said, I may not believe in Christianity, but I'm grateful to it. But... I just want to pick up, to answer your question, Justin, pick up on something you said there to go. I want to be very careful here. It's not that I'm saying because of Jesus' death on the cross or some such thing, human beings have, have, have rights. I think the cross has a lot to say about, about human value because if God values you and I so much that he would do what he did in the person of Jesus, that tells me, firstly, that we're, very, we're loved and we're valued. It also tells us there was something profoundly damaged about the human condition such that God would go to such lengths. Yep. Christianity and Judaism, I want to couple the two to, to, together here, have always based that on that right out of that Genesis idea that it's in the very nature of how we're constructed, that there is the very, the very nature of what it means to be human. When God created human life in his image, that meant that there is something ontologically, to use the philosophical language, in our very nature that's, uh, that's fundamentally different. I just want to raise a, a question back, though, if I may, well, Justin, just, or do you want to ask I, something? I think there was one more point, though, that, that yes, okay. uh, Justin wanted yeah. to, to, push uh, to push you on, which Dude. is this sense of, oh, yes. he's saying, w should we expand this circle? It. So if, if, say, artificial intelligence Absolutely. develops some consciousness, would that then acquire the kind of rights that Christianity yeah. has so far only ascribed Absolutely. to humans and, and yeah. so on? Well, one of my questions there, of course, would be, we said earlier that rights and responsibilities go together. So if Siri ever achieves consciousness, she'll have a responsibility to actually get me to Starbucks correctly <laughs> rather than, you know, some alley down the back of Abbotsford somewhere. So until that happens... Um, but very seriously, I think that the, the, the question of expansion, this is why I think the rights and responsibilities piece is so important. Because actually, one of the things that's happened in this sort of sense that we feel we need to push rights out and include all kinds of things, um, other animals, um, a South American country, I think it was Brazil, uh, was recently uh, reported as contemplating it wanted to grant rights to rainforests. Um, because they wanted to stop deforestation. Uh, Justin's question about rights for, for AI, if ever we got uh, you know, machines that were self-aware, that comes out of this idea that, uh, that unless something has a right, we can't protect it. I want to flip that on its head and say, I don't think there's enough talk about responsibility. And Justin, you mentioned this right at the start, yep. that if we think about it that way, that as human beings, Yes, we have a certain set of rights that flow from value and dignity, but we also have a certain sense of responsibilities. And I'd be saying to the Brazilian government, I mean, you don't need to grant rights to rainforests. We have a responsibility out of being human. That means we should treat the natural world in a certain way. And I think that is how I'd begin to answer as a Christian philosopher things like the AI question, that if that ever happened, and the, you know, I've got a background in computer science, so I am a little bit AI skeptical, but let's suppose that it were, then I would have a responsibility in terms of how I dealt with that particular entity. Not because it somehow magically acquires a certain set of rights, but because I have a responsibility that flows out of who I am. And that's a responsibility that affects how I treat the natural world, how I treat other human beings, how I treat animals, and so on and so forth. And I think there's been a little bit more sort of tendency in our culture to obsess on rights language without necessarily also looking at responsibility and duty language as well. And I think we want to hold the I, two together. I do agree. Yeah. Historically, they have gone together. Yeah. You wanted to, I mean, coming to the question of um, responsibilities and duties, I suppose the interesting question for me is, you, you obviously believe in this idea of universal human rights, mm -hmm. Justin, flowing from the, the capacities that people have. How do you ground the, the duty that people have to respect that? How do, how do we get to the oughtness, if you like, mm. of morality, of, of the way we should treat other human beings? Because it's one thing to say, I believe everyone does have, uh, these particular ideas of dignity and equality inherent yeah. within them. It's another thing to say, and you should respect that. 
whether you're a Mao or a Hitler or some peace-loving person, it, what, what, is, what makes it the case that there's this, this oughtness about the nature of humanity? Good question. Um, I think <laughs> if you look at the way the Declaration came about, this wasn't one nation posing itself on other nations. Mm. This is a declaration that's been signed by just about every nation. This is a process that many different nations entered into to come up with this sort of consensus. There's a few names that I wanted to throw out there because I think it's instructive here just to prove that this wasn't just a Western imposition. Um, and uh, some of this was new to me as I was coming to understand the history of how the Declaration got created. So there was a Charles Habib Malik of Lebanon who was a key author. Um, P.G. Chang of China, these statesmen from different countries across Asia were extremely involved in setting this up. Um, an Indian delegation was behind the rights of women, including that in the Charter. An Egyptian delegation argued for its universality. A Pakistani dele delegation argued against child marriages. Um, so th this really was the pooling of mm. resources, mm. and to my earlier comment, different threads that were weaving throughout history in terms of different approaches to human rights all sort of culminating in this document. So I think that does suggest universality, that does make the whole concept of human rights something that once it's been enacted and everybody's kind of signed on to it, or all the nations at least have, that it's something that has now been legitimized at but, that But is it then simply, level. as long as the majority agree on something, that is what creates the, mm. the, 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 the moral sort of impetus, the, 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 the oughtness of it? Because I suppose that, it, obviously I'm guessing North Korea wasn't a signatory, for instance, to the, does that mean that, that they just have to obey it because the majority agreed to it? Well, I think, in a way, yeah. And, well, more than that. I mean, if, if you look at, let's say, for example, North Korea or any tyrannic, or tyrannic country, the lack of human rights is what allows these countries to impose themselves on their people. The, the ability to appeal to an international body of human rights, to the international community, if you will, to international law, among other things, is what allows individuals in these countries to have some hope of arguing their case against these tyrannical governments. Not that in North Korea they have much of a chance to do that. Um, but, it, but it does give some legitimacy to an individual in some far-flung corner in the world whose rights are being trampled by the by the, the government of his country, where else would he go if, the gover if, if his sovereign government is sort of the be-all and end-all of, of, of law and, and right, then there is no other place to appeal to. So I think it's really important that this be at the international level. Uh, so mm. f what do you make of this idea yeah. that universal agreement is what makes this morally binding on people to treat, treat yeah. others in this way? Well, I want to say a couple of things, actually. I'm noticing that you're, Justin's answering every question with, that's a good question, and I'm starting everything saying, there's a couple of things I want to say. <laughs> you know, it's like pattern developing here, but there we go. Um, I think I appreciate what some of Justin shared there. I mean, there was certainly a lot of people involved in that, in that, in that drawing together of the UDHR, but we also need to be careful also not to romanticize history. Um, we need to remember that, of course, part of the impetus for the UDHR was what had happened, you know, obviously growing out of Europe, but, in, but with, the, with uh, affecting the world more widely with World War II. And at the end of World War II, um, something called the Nuremberg Trials happened. Mm -hmm. And the Nuremberg Trials were when many of the former German SS officers and Third Reich leaders were put on trial uh, for crimes against humanity. That wasn't the language that was used, but that was effectively what was done. And what was interesting was every, almost every uh, person who was put on trial for their actions during World War II tried the same defense. We were just following the laws of our country. We were just doing you know, what was considered right by the standards of German society at the time. And it's the right thing to do to follow orders. It's the right thing to do to follow the law of your country. And the Nuremberg judges ruled to a man and to one woman, there was one woman on the panel, ruled that there are standards of behavior and rights and wrongs and ethics and duties and so forth that transcend countries, that it doesn't matter what, you're, what, you, what the majority tell you to do, there are things above that. And that was really quite an impetus in, the, in, the, in what then moved into the, the formation period of the UDHR. But it's interesting that not every, not every country did sign on. I mean, for example, the, uh, the Organization of the Islamic Conference, the OIEC countries, have their own version of the, uh, the Human Rights Code with some particular changes. I mean, Those countries did sign the original. They signed the original and then, of course, made changes. Changes around particularly the, uh, the freedoms uh, uh, allowed to women yep. and freedom of, of religion. Um, and then, of course, even now there are countries that take a dim view on things like political association, such as China. And I remember that this uh, arising Justin, this Justin, um, <laughs> had a very interesting conversation just a few weeks ago with a university student at Aberdeen University in Scotland, where I'd just done an event. 
and she came and talked to me, and she self-identified as a communist. And they're quite rare, which is interesting. So it was a fascinating conversation. But she also was, a, was an advocate for human rights. She was a big believer in, in mm. human rights. Sort of interesting the way these things combined. And uh, during the conversation, um, I just gently shared with her. I said, well, you do realize that I think, you know, in, in my view at least, if there is no God, then, then really what you're espousing is, is a set of preferences. And you may be able to find a few other people to, to round up amount around you, but it's a set of preferences. So the question I put to you is how can you go to other countries and other cultures and tell them they should abide by our preferences? And I think this is a huge issue because even if it's, even if it's something approaching the majority, you sort of run into the kind of problem that Friedrich Nietzsche raised, the absence of God, really what it's about is how much power you can grab. And if you can grab enough power and, and wield enough influence, you can enforce uh, your, right, your rights, your wrongs, your ideals as normative. But that doesn't make them right. No. It just makes you the bigger bully. And I think that's one of my questions around the universality of this, that even if you could theoretically get everyone to sign on, that doesn't make it necessarily right in that, it, that it's true. It simply means you've got enough people to sign on. But Andy, that's a very good question, by the way. <laughs> there you go. And I'll say and two things. And, and it's a question that I, want to, that I do want to address, because yes. I think what, what you've rather cleverly done, uh, if you don't mind me saying, is, is you've taken the debate away from it's okay that you've done this, this conversation about the foundation, whether it's yeah. better atheistically or an atheist foundation versus a Christian foundation, and now we're having an argument about the universality of human rights as though it's only my burden to bear to answer that. But from a Christian point of view, how, how, do you, how do you make any sense of it? The, the point of universalizing human rights was that it was something that would cross all creeds and religions. So if your claim, and maybe it's not your claim, yeah. but if your claim is we have to all accept the reality of Christian truth in order to find yeah. the right foundation for universality, then you have a whole other thing you have to do. You've got to get everybody to be a Christian, and then you've got to convince them that Christianity Fantastic. gets you to human rights. I'm not arguing that. I don't, <laughs> no, no. I'm not saying you all have to be an atheist. I don't care if you are atheists we'll or not atheists. You, later, you just never insane. become atheists. What I'm trying to do is ground this yeah. in the natural world, which we all agree exists, Christians and atheists alike. If we can do that, then we have the recipe for universality. If we all have to become yeah. Christian, then two-thirds of the world's not Christian. And you're not going to get 100% of the world to ever oh, become so Christian. Do you have to be so a then Christian you're doomed. Doomed. Yeah. to believe in well, the Christian foundation? Let's follow the trend. I've just got a couple of things to say in regards to that. Um, I thought you would. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's great. Absolutely what I'm not, not saying, and I can only apologize if I've given that impression, is you have to believe in a Christian to, to have human rights. What I do believe, though, is that if the Christian story isn't true, a number of things go with it. And that's one reason why I often come back to someone like Nietzsche, because I've reason, one of the reasons I admire him as a philosopher, I think he's one of the atheist philosophers who saw this the most clearly, that if there is no God, it's not just some minor fact about the universe has changed, a number of things have changed. One of them, and we, 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 we may not have time to get on this uh, in the dialogue now, but it may come, we can go into it in the Q&A if you like, because it's related. Um, the whole idea of freedom and autonomy and self-determination. It's a huge question whether that's, that's, that, that's, that can stand on naturalistic materialism because you re we really are just a, a series of physical processes in the same way this, I think it's a log. Um, <laughs> we can agree on that. We agree it's a log. Um, well, I, I think it's a sort of, you know, sort of very rustic British Columbia computer. It's a log in. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. But anyway, okay, stay, stay, you win. Hey, you win. Now stop. <laughs> stick with the philosophy. But let me stick with the philosophy very quickly. Yeah. Let me give you an illustration for what I'm trying to get at here, because I'm, I'm, you know, I'm on, I'm jet lagged. And <laughs> so um, illustrations, I think, help. And I used this one the other, the other night. If any of you were there, let's imagine uh, Justin and Justin, perhaps all three of us. But Justin, let's imagine Just, you know, Justin B. Justin yeah. B. Because okay. you know we live in the same country. Okay. Let's imagine that uh, you know every week we go to the pub. And we have a beer or a, or a Coke, if there are any Baptists in the room. Um, <laughs> no Baptists tonight. Fantastic. Bring it on. And, um, and we have a beer with a friend of ours. We see him every week. You know, let's call him Tom. You know, we're, we're good mates. <laughs> and then one week, we say to him, oh, you know, it's been great chatting with you tonight, Tom. We'll see. Uh, oh, no, sorry. Our friend Tom, by the way, is a flat earther. This is to uh, make the illustration work. And um, if you don't think this is serious, the flat earth community is growing. Mm. I don't, I, like, they're growing sort of sideways and outwards, not, not round, obviously, but Google, there's, there's loads of them. I don't know where they're coming from. Anyway, Tom's a flat earther. We've tried to convince him we can't otherwise. Anyway, we just finished having a beer one week with him, and we say, we'll see you next week, Tom, usual time. He goes, oh, no, no, sorry, guys, I, I can't see you for the next couple of months. I'm going off on a round-the-world cruise. 
And we're like, what? <laughs> you're a flat earther. What do you mean you're going around the world cruise? And he gets all upset and aggravated. And he said, how, how dare you? How dare you infringe my rights? How dare you tell me that people who believe in flat earth can't go on round the world cruises? How arrogant. How arrogant. What's going on in that conversation? What's going on in that conversation is you can believe in, a flat, in flat Earth theory and you can cruise to Australia. The thing is, your Flat Earth theory can't sustain your cruising to Australia. You actually have to borrow from Round Earth theory in order to go around the world. Or if there's any Flat Earthers this evening, they'll probably come and nod with me afterwards and go, no, you're wrong, and this is why. <laughs> um, and I think something for me is going on similar in this discussion around worldviews. I think absolutely, as a, as a, as a humanist, as an atheist, as a Buddhist, a Muslim, a Hindu, a Jedi, if there's any in the room tonight, <laughs> you, can, you can believe in a whole series of things. You can believe in freedom, you can believe in consciousness, you can believe in mind, you can believe in inherent dignity, but I don't think your worldview has the resources to sustain those. So you don't need to be a Christian, but if Christianity isn't true, I don't think you, I, or anyone here has dignity. So of course I would say pretty much the same thing, that just as you think I kind of borrow from the Christian worldview in order to ground, you know, we've had this debate many times, yeah. ground morality, yes, ground meaning, ground, uh, what are we debating tonight? Oh yeah, human rights. That's right. Um, yes. Then <laughs> I, could, I could just kind of make the same claim, right? That Christians are actually grounding their arguments for, found, for a foundation on, on the natural world, although they may be dressing it up a little bit well, differently. Well, how so? Um, well, on, on flesh but what I, what I wanted to ask you, I okay. really want to come back on something here because you mentioned that the Christian worldview must be true in order for, for there to be rights, right? In order for humans to have the dignity necessary to lay a foundation. If they're not just a fiction, rights. yes. Okay. Um, now, the, the historicity of Jesus dying on the cross, this is a historical event that happened in a particular time and place. That's your claim. Before that, there was thousands and thousands of years of human history. I think by some estimates, there were 47 billion humans who lived and died before that temporal event took place. I, I guess what I'm wondering is, if it changed everything the way you're saying it did, then for 47 billion humans, they lived and died without value or meaning. And they, if an act happened before yeah. Jesus, if a murder happened before Jesus, well, it wasn't actually a, a moral crime because this act somehow created so, the dignity. Is, is that the what you're actually saying? I, well, first I say a couple of things. It's, it's not 47 billion. Yeah. Um, it's, it's probably under, under a billion, actually. But, but, but your point still stands. Yeah, as Justin said, that's not what I'm saying, Justin. This is so confusing with <laughs> Justin. What I'm, what I'm saying is, but let me bring, bring Jesus into it very briefly since you raised JC to go with JB and <laughs> JT. Um, I'm saying, again, I bring you back to Genesis chapter one. I'm saying when God created human beings right at the very beginning, he imbued them with the image of God. And we can, we can discuss exactly what that means. But the idea is that built into our very nature is that we have value and we have dignity because mm -hmm. of the way that God constructed us. So that was true before Jesus came along. However, however, what Jesus coming along demonstrated in the Christian tradition is the incredible love and value that God has for, <laughs> I love it, amen, sorry, <laughs> um, for each and every one of us. And just because up until that point, God hadn't done that tremendous act of sacrifice, doesn't mean God didn't love us any less. By, and by analogy, if I was to go out, if I was to get home from this trip, you know, on Tuesday, and my five-year-old daughter's playing out in the street, and I see, you know, one of the garbage trucks in our community that uses our street to practice for NASCAR driving, you know, roaring down the street, I run out of the door, and I throw my daughter out of the way, but get flattened by the garbage truck, and then some sort of philosophical clown comes along and says, oh, well, you know, Andy didn't really love his daughter for the first five and a half years of her life. It was only, you know, today that he demonstrated love for her. There would be, there would be a misunderstanding because at that point, that was perhaps the most supreme revelation of my love for Katrina in that Christians would say that when Jesus came and died on the cross, that was the supreme I'm revelation. I'm having a bit of us. trouble understanding that. I'm not trying to be facetious. I no. really am. If, if everything was already sort of there, um, in terms of how God created us yeah. in Genesis and all of that, and this was just an act of demonstration, then I still don't understand why you need a demonstration in order to confer meaning and value. And if it is just a demonstration, isn't it only those who are, were kind of witness to the demonstration or those who heard about it for whom this can have any kind of effect? Which means most people <sighs> wouldn't have heard about, you know, wouldn't have been affected by it in that demonstrable. Yeah. 
in that particular way. I won't even try to pronounce that. <laughs> if in that's that not a word, way. it should be. <laughs> yes, thank you. It is tonight for, for thousands of years until they, you know, until they heard the good yeah. news, as you, as you might put it. Well, again, I, I think we're slightly talking kind of past one another here. So to, so to reiterate, the, the value that human beings have was, is, is kind of baked into who we are from the moment that God, God has made us. To be a human being is to bear the image of God and to have value and dignity. But of course, I mean, what's so exciting about your, your question, I'm being so careful because I don't want to start preaching. This is a dialogue. Mm -hmm. And in all seriousness, actually, you know, I, I, I said this the other, the other night, and I don't say this to be flippant, you know, I'm hugely grateful Justin, that you're willing to come and have dialogues like this, because I know it isn't easy, because we, we've done these things in mixed audiences. This really is not a mixed <laughs> audience. So, the, 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 well, there, there may be a few Anglicans in the room, but, you know. <laughs> but, um, but, the, but the thing about the cross, of course, that's so exciting, and this does actually tie in very much, actually, to, 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 to the human rights discussion, although we may have time to explore this in huge detail, is, of course, one of, the, one of the reasons why human rights and, and all this dialogue is necessary is human beings are very strange animals. We have the ability to do great good, and we have the ability to do great evil. And humans are, have this issue that in our nature there is something sort of, sort of fundamentally twisted. Now, if you're a Christian, you can use the term sin. If you're an atheist like John Gray, you can just say we're a messed up animal. Um, but we can all pretty much universally agree that if you just open the newspaper, you can see there's a problem. And so, as you're, as you're aware, because you've hung around Christians enough, that the Christian story, of course, is what's happening on the cross, is God actually doing something about that problem of our broken nature, which is why we have all these problems in the first place. But it flows out of the value that God's placed upon us. And it wasn't something that started, God started valuing human beings right. differently sometime well, the, around the about 83. The sinful nature of, of humans, that was always my understanding of why it was necessary for God to sacrifice Jesus on the cross. But I thought that was to repair the broken relationship between man and God, this issue of sin and salvation, rather than to make any kind of statement about the human relationship with other humans, which is, of course, what human rights is really oh, all but about. It, but it does, right? Because it does two things. Well, it's interesting here. I mean, I'm gr it's fascinating we're talking about Jesus, right? Because, I mean, Jesus was famously asked, you know, which is the greatest law on, in the Old Testament? And, of course, you know, if you know your Judaism, you know the hundreds of the darn things. And, uh, and Jesus... I, just, I always like the answer because I think it must be like with a, with a twinkle in his eye. Like any good philosopher or theologian, he was asked to give one answer and he gave two. So, I mean, good company when I say I. <laughs> and, um, and Jesus said two things. He said, love God and love your neighbor. Why did he put those two together? Because if you love God, it tells you who you are. And in order to love other people, you actually need to know who you are. You need to be secure in your identity. You need to know what it means to be human. And then, of course, the, but then that flows outwards into loving the person next to you. We can only love the person next to you if you know they have value and dignity and are worth inherently more than just a very nice kind of wooden table. So those things go together. But God's actions in what he did in the person of Jesus on the cross, you know, God didn't in the person of Jesus die for, you know, aardvarks or tables or lettuces or eggplants. It was human beings showing in that action the value that he placed upon us. So it is this demonstration. We and love other people as a way of showing our devotion to God or as an end in and of itself? I think it's both and. And Christian ethics, one of the things that I always found fascinating about Christian ethics compared to, not, not, not every, because that's unfair, but certainly many other ethical systems, is that Christian ethics, when understood properly, is a lived response in gratitude. It says, look at what Jesus has done for me and be so incredibly overwhelmed with gratitude and wonder for that 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 would change mm. how I view others. And of course, the other thing as well that I think flows out of this human rights discussion we're having tonight is of course, one of the things we tend to do as human beings is divide each other into, into groups, them and us. And one of the things that generates that is superiority. If I think I'm better than you mm -hmm. because I have a British accent or, uh, <laughs> or less hair, um, I don't think that, because not merely there's another man with a British accent here and that cuts through that. And more hair. If I think I'm superior, <laughs> and more hair. I'm actually the unique one on this stage. <laughs> but if you, can, if, you can be, if you can think of yourself in a way that's superior, you're quite a way down the line to dividing people into them and ours and treating those who are not like you abhorrently. And I think one of the things that, certainly for me, that was profound in the Christian worldview and encountering Jesus was the gospel is actually, when you take it seriously, cuts you down to size because it tells you that you aren't something... Let uh, we, we've had a really anyway. good discussion. I'm aware we're, we're only five minutes or so five away from having to, to, to start wrapping things up. Mm. I know. Um, 
and you've asked a lot of questions here of, of, of trying to make sense of Andy's view as a Christian of, of human rights. I wonder if, if there could be some questions in the, in the opposite sure. direction in yeah. the last few minutes. In as much as I think you, you started to lay out some idea of how um, humanism or, or atheism better grounds, if you like, for you, the idea of human, human rights than, than Christianity does. Um, so, so just put, putting that question to you, I think Andy's criticism is uh, it's very difficult to see how we can have this sense of intrinsic human rights if, if actually it all really boils down to preferences. You know, we happen to have developed this particular view uh, under this particular constitution of a document. But in what sense does an atheistic worldview actually enable you to say, yes, and this does apply to everyone absolutely across all places and times? Well, similar to what I was saying earlier, the mere fact that a, a human rights truth is discovered or I don't want to use that word, um, is, is reasoned in one particular place and time doesn't mean that it doesn't have validity universally. Um, I, I think earlier I mentioned the example of mathematical or scientific truths, um, which can be discovered in, again, certain places and times, but other people can readily understand that, that there is a rational um, reason uh, to, to believe that that's true. I think the same can be said of, of human rights and of morality generally, that we can arrive at those truths locally, if you will, but then we can argue them r through the power of rationality, which is something that we all share, and then we can make our case to other people. What's, what's your problem with this particular way of arriving at, at, a, at a grounding of these human rights? Uh, well, I think I said a couple of things. What's, what's interesting is how easily one slips into normative language, because your analogy there, Justin, of, of mathematical truths and scientific truths, of course, those things are out there to be discovered. You know, we don't invent the law of gravity. We go out and we experiment and we observe and go, oh, it's out there, it's external mm -hmm. to us. And it doesn't matter if every single one of us in the world doesn't believe it, but it's still true. And so I guess my question to you would be, yeah, let me turn that around and go, does the same apply to perhaps human rights theory? Let's imagine that the majority of people don't believe in human rights, which actually was the situation for the majority of, of human history, um, that actually, you know, people gen generally were incredibly tribal and really, you know, sort of uh, respect went no more than your kinship group. But let's suppose that the majority of people don't believe in human rights. Let's perhaps we do a mass hypnotism experiment. You know, philosophers love thought experiments. And we convince everyone, you know, just to be sort of, uh, you know, sort of cold-hearted and, you know, distant and remote and just like Justin as a, as a moderator. <laughs> um, does that change reality or would you still say, no, I don't care. I don't care if I can't convince anybody, if I'm the only person on the planet, only me, Justin Trotier, who believes that humans have value and dignity and we should behave a certain way. Does that make your belief false it's, or is it true even if nobody believes it to be true? Yeah, it, it's not a platonic truth in the set which, so the analogy, it's not a perfect analogy, of course. I'm not saying that <clears throat> human rights or moral <clears throat> truths are are in that sense objective, that they, that they exist um, out there in the universe, that if humans didn't exist, I think I said this earlier, that they would still be true. I think it's, we need for there to be human beings for there to be human rights, but or do we all have other to, sentient But do we have creatures. to all agree on those rights, I suppose, is Andy's question. If mm. no one believed in it, except for you, yeah. would it still be true? Uh, there are, I think that there are certain ones that, that are um, generally agreeable across the human family, and then there are others that are more debatable. And where I would draw the line is those freedoms and rights that are, mm -hmm. um, that are sort of the minimal requirements in order for us to be able to even engage in this kind of debate about human rights. We would, we would need to agree on those at least. Otherwise, we'd be limiting our ability to, yeah. to explore the universe and to find, yeah. to find truth. So things yeah. like freedom of thought, freedom of expression, freedom of religion, I think those would be what I would call the basic human rights. That if we don't even have those, then we can't, mm. we can't even really get off the ground. I still think, whether it's like I haven't done a good job in communicating it or, or you're doing a very good job in sort of dancing around it, probably the former, um, but if it's, if it's that no, you are the only person who's convinced about this, I mean, let me give you a very, let's, let's take a real world example rather than a thought experiment. It's very interesting that for the majority of human history, every human civilization practiced slavery. You know, the Europeans have ha had it in the neck because of what we did in terms of slavery, quite rightly so. But the Persians, the Greeks, mm -hmm. the Romans, the Chinese, the Arabs, uh, the indigenous peoples here in uh, North America practiced it on one another. Every civilization that anthropologists know of has practiced slavery. So does that mean until we, are, we arrived at sort of modern human rights and the idea that, it's, that, 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 that behavior is wrong, was it okay? Was Aristotle all right? Was Aristotle 
perfectly moral to say it's okay for slavery. No. Some people are born to be slaves. Or was he wrong then, even though everyone agreed with him? Yes, of course he was wrong then, but the Bible didn't overturn slavery. Well, I'm not saying and it did. I, what I'm trying to get into is, is are these, this, this human dignity and the things that flow from it, are they, are they, are they external yeah. to us, or are they just a set of preferences, whether it's yours, the three of us, or a wider group? I, I, that's the question. Yeah, and I think that's a challenging question for equally for both of us, because I don't think you can, I don't think that there is any clear answer to, for example, the slavery question from the Bible. If anything, the Bible seems to support slavery. So some Christians use those references to continue to um, support this um, horrifying institution, and other Christians, like Martin Luther King, of course, for, is a great example, uh, use his religiosity to, to oppose slavery. But aside from so, all of that, back then, no, but was, was slavery okay if everyone agreed with it? No. But, um, but then I think that, as you say, I think that's a profound challenge. But that's, that's neither, but that, that it is a challenge, but it's an equal challenge to all of but us. But you've been challenging so, me for the evening, so I'm now turning this, the favor no, on but you. The, from your perspective, no, that's, and you can do that, you do that's that fine. Challenge. But you're, you're, if you're trying to suggest that that's a challenge that's unique to an atheist, to an atheistic worldview, I think that's kind of unfair. Um, it's, a, it's a challenge to um, come to a decision on a whole panoply of moral questions, regardless of the tradition that we're in. Again, I just, I don't see that Christianity has a toehold on that particular question or well, other I'm questions very like happy that. To give my perspective capital punishment, for example. Very happy um, to give my we perspective. can have a debate about capital punishment. Let's not Some, go there, because we're already over time. But the point is that there are so many questions that within the Christian tradition, there is no clear-cut answer, because the Bible can be interpreted in, in Let, different ways. I'll just give um, you both a chance just to sum up what we've heard so far this evening, because we do have to go to a break, and, and yeah, I need to, to give people a chance to uh, gather their thoughts and gather send their, their questions in. So, questions in. Andy, just 30 seconds, and then... 30 seconds? I, just, I can't do anything in Justin 30 seconds, it. Justin, but, <laughs> but there we go. Um, I think what I want to do in my 30 seconds is, is just bring it down to the questions that we, we, we already began with. To me, it all hinges on, do we have... Does the person sitting next to you this evening have intrinsic value, intrinsic dignity? They would have that if nobody else believed it, uh, they would have it irregardless of time or space, irregardless of their abilities. And then one has to ask yourself the question, does that flow more naturally from the Christian idea, the Christian, the biblical claim that we're made in the image of God? And that's actually the answer to that challenge Justin raised. That yes, there's, there's hard work to do in Christian ethics, but it flows out of what is it to be a human? Which is why I think the first question on the human project is brilliant. What is human? We need to answer that question. What does it mean to be a human being? Or can you fit that on the idea that we are nothing more than atoms and particles governed by the same laws of physics and chemistry and biology and nothing else as govern the water cooling in our mugs or the, 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 uh, the wooden tables here on the, uh, on the podium? I think that's the, the question that everything else flows from. What does it mean to be human and do we have value and dignity? I would just say that I think the natural worldview that I'm trying to espouse tonight is the one that is more open, that is more future-oriented, that when we do, for example, encounter alien intelligence or we create AI, we're going to be able to tackle those questions because we don't presuppose that we have to embrace one particular creed or that we have to limit human rights to uh, those who either look like us or share our religion. And I, and I really kind of haven't seen a good argument put forward on the other side tonight, that Christianity, which was groundbreaking at the time and did expand that circle of rights and protections to all of humans, that it has any ability to go beyond that. Um, the natural worldview that I'm espousing, it's a challenge to answer these questions, but it is the only way forward if we're going to find a way for us to have a solid foundation for human rights that doesn't depend on any one particular creed or religious tradition. And if universal human rights that concept universality is at all meaningful. It means we have to find a common framework that can cut across all religious traditions. So not an easy thing to do for any of us here, but if we can find a way to do it through an understanding and a commitment to the natural world, which all of us, I think, agree exists, I hope most of us do, uh, <laughs> then, we're, then we're on much solid uh, footing to have a truly universal approach to these questions. Let's give a round of applause to both Justin and Andy.